Hi, Steve Ellingson here from Virginia Tech. My talk is on path loss and propagation channels enabled by reconfigurable intelligence services. Here's a cartoon showing a RIS enabled channel. T and R represent the transmitter and receiver respectively. Here the path to the receiver is obstructed to the point where the path loss may be too high, requiring that the power be directed around the obstacle here using an RIS. However, the analysis that is required to fully understand this is itself broadly applicable, that is, to things like spatial multiplexing and MIMO and so on. So please stand by if the blockage avoidance application is not your particular cup of tea. So the first thing I will present is a simple physical model for received power in an RIS-enabled channel as a function of RIS size, link geometry, and the method used to set the element's state. Of course, there are other models now available doing similar things, as I point out in my paper, and these have various advantages and disadvantages relative to what I'm about to show here. There are basically three distinctions in this work having to do with the use and applications of the model. First, a simple element scattering model that is consistent with electromagnetic scattering theory and practical reflector ray design. Second, I'll address the question of how big an RIS is required to achieve path loss equal to that of the free space path of equal path length, addressing the application I'm showing on the left. And then finally, path loss behaviors as a function of RIS size, link geometry, and the method used to set the element state. Okay, let's start with a problem statement and define some notation. Starting on the transmit end, P sub T is the transmit power. That power is being transmitted through an antenna directivity, or gain as we say, G sub T in the direction of the RIS. At the RIS, the power is scattered, in particular towards the receiver. It is received through a receive antenna directivity, G sub R, and we're evaluating that obviously in the direction of the RIS, yielding a received power P sub R. So the question here is, what is the received power P sub R? And I should note, I'm going to ignore polarization for this talk. Uh, this is customary in path loss analysis, which is what I'm primarily focused on here. However, this is hardly a limitation, except perhaps in the near case that I'll address at the very end of this talk. To do the problem, we evaluate the total scattering as the sum of scattering from the elements as shown here. Here's the expression that you get. Here I'm just summing over the contributions from each of the big N number of elements. V sub N is the phase associated with the total path length. That's separate from what the RIS is trying to do. And B sub N is the magnitude and phase that the element imparts on its contribution to the scattering. So B sub N is how the RIS controls the channel. It's pretty straightforward to work out that the contribution associated with each element of the RIS is given by this expression, in which G sub E is the embedded element pattern. G sub E appears here in the expression twice, once for reception and once for scattering. Note that the pattern is assumed to be the same for receiving and for scattering. Uh, this is a reasonable assumption to make from an electromagnetic theory viewpoint as long as those scattering elements are electrically small, as they would be for a uh, patch-like element. Also note that I'm assuming that the embedded element pattern is the same for every element, which is the same as saying that mutual coupling is not significant. This is a safe assumption as long as the surface is large, that is, it has lots of elements. So the ratio of edge elements to interior elements is uh, small. Epsilon sub P is an efficiency term describing loss internal to the element scattering process. Let me emphasize that there is nothing controversial about this derivation, and it requires nothing more than undergraduate electromagnetics. And others have done somewhat similar things. So I've skipped the derivation for the purposes of this talk, but you can certainly find it in the paper. Finally, I'll say that although this is uh, quite general, it is not in the form of the freeze equation in the sense that there is no explicit path loss factor identified. So we're going to have to extract that. To distill this solution down to something that looks like the freeze equation, we need to make the effects of the transmitter and receiver gains independent of the element, that is independent of N, so they can be factored out of the sum. 
So what we do is we simply assume that the transmit directivities are equal to a single transmit directivity in some reference direction. And similarly, the receive directivity is the same as a constant receive directivity in some reference direction. This is going to be a pretty good assumption if the RIS is far from the transmitter to receiver, and also a pretty good assumption even if the RIS is relatively close, as long as the transmitter and receiver antenna patterns are not too narrow. Even then, it might work, and I may say more about that later. Once this approximation is made, then the transmitter and receiver gains can be factored out, and we find that the path loss is given by this expression, so that all that remains is to find an expression for these element scattering patterns. So let me address the element pattern model. First, let me emphasize that if you already have an element pattern, there's nothing stopping you from using it. If you don't have an element pattern, then what I'm showing here is my suggestion. The cosine to a power function is a well-established model for low gain elements, such as patches, that would likely be used in a practical RIS. In this model, the relationship between gamma and Q is constrained by conservation of power as indicated here. So if you select one, then the other is determined. If you are working with a particular element and know only its broadside gain, that is the gain in the perpendicular direction to the surface, you can use this to solve for Q and then use this model in your application. If you're still not sure how to choose Q, then I have a suggested benchmark pattern, and that's as follows. You choose G sub E such that the sum of the effective apertures of the elements equals the physical area of the RIS when the spacing between elements is lambda by two. In this case, you get that the broadside directivity is 5 dBi, which is a very typical value for something like a patch. Uh, gamma turns out to be pi in this case, and Q turns out to be the value 0.285, and I will refer to this as Q sub naught. I think this is useful as a benchmark because the resulting RIS scatters with 100% aperture efficiency. That is, all the power incident on the surface which is not dissipated internally, gets re-radiated. This corresponds to a well-designed array and also something which is physically realizable. Now that the basics are in place, I would like to see what this model says about the FAR case. By FAR here, I mean simply that the path distances are approximately independent of the element index in magnitude calculations. The phase calculations continue to be exact. This results in a pretty dramatic simplification. However, before proceeding, just let me point out that far case does not necessarily correspond to the electromagnetic far field, although the two are obviously somewhat related. Uh, just to be clear, when I say far case here, it is simply referring to this approximation shown on the slide. If I apply the benchmark pattern, I get the expression shown here in which that cosine pattern function is now represented as the dot product between vectors, which I find to be uh, a somewhat more useful. If you wanted, you could put cosines there instead of dot products. If I use the phases of V sub n's to maximize path gain, then this factor reduces to n squared, and I have the expression shown here. So this is what I get for a method of setting element states that maximizes the path gain minimizes the path loss. I'll do one more thing, and that's to say that the element spacing will be one half wavelength. And if I do that, now I can determine the area, or I can specify the area of the RIS. So here I've converted a number of elements into area using the lambda by two spacing. And I get this expression uh, now shown at the bottom of the slide. This expression is satisfying because it corresponds to a well-known result from radar theory. Specifically, in the monostatic normal incidence case, the path gain for scattering from a conducting plate of area A is given precisely by this factor. So this agrees with electromagnetic uh, radar scattering theory. Okay, now we are ready to address the second point that I brought up at the beginning of this talk, that is, how big must the surface be in order to yield path loss equal to the equal length free space path? 
Well, free space path loss is given by this familiar expression. So we can use this to make an expression for the ratio of the path losses. And it turns out to be remarkably simple as shown here. For the choices I've made, it turns out that this ratio depends only on the surface area, A, the frequency, shown here as wave, in terms of wavelengths, and this quantity, F sub E, which I'm calling the effective focal length. Here, the concept of effective focal length is introduced simply as a way to compactly describe the dependence of the two distances, R super I and R super S, as a single variable. However, those familiar with optics or photography might see a deeper connection, which I think is valid and provides some insight. The relative performance of the RIS-enabled channel improves when the effective focal length is decreased. This means that the key to making the RIS-enabled channel perform well is to make either the incident or scattered path length much less than the total path length. That is, put the RIS as close as you can to either the transmitter or the receiver. Of course, this is something that others have discovered as well, but I think the interesting thing here is that the principle emerges from a very, very simple analysis. Okay, so now we're ready to calculate the size of an intelligent surface that's required to yield path loss equal to that of the free space path of equal length. If we parameterize this analysis in terms of effective focal length, then the issue of where the RIS is placed relative to the transmitter and receiver doesn't matter. All that matters is frequency, effective focal length, and link geometry. As far as link geometry, I'll consider two cases. One case, I will assume perfect scattering and monostatic geometry, which minimizes the path loss and therefore gives the minimum size. I also define a typical case in which the angles to the transmitter and receiver are both 60 degrees from the normal, and the scattering efficiency is a typical value of 50%. So this obviously gives you a larger required area. In the top table on the right, Note that frequencies run from 800 megahertz to 60 gigahertz, and we see that surfaces on the order of tens of meters are required. Note also that the required size generally decreases with frequency. The same results are shown again on the bottom table, but now expressed in terms of wavelengths. Not surprisingly, we see sizes on the order of tens to hundreds of wavelengths are required. However, what might be a surprise is that the required side length of the surface increases with the square root of frequency. This brings us to the final part of this talk, where I'd like to address the question of how path loss varies with the surface size, and now no longer constrained to scenarios where the far case assumptions apply. In order to do this, we have to backtrack to the expression shown here that I presented earlier. However, we'll continue to assume the benchmark element pattern and assume half wavelength spacing. We'll also continue to constrain the B sub n's to have unit magnitude. However, we are no longer constrained to be in the far scenario, so we want to consider a second method for setting the phase of the B sub n's. The first method, which is what we were implicitly doing before, we could reasonably call focusing, which will always minimize the path loss. The second approach we'll consider is what we'll call beam forming, which you may interpret as having the RIS focus at infinity. And here's the relevant expression. Note that this is clearly suboptimal, but there are two practical reasons why this is a worthwhile method to consider. First, beamforming requires only the direction to the receiver and not the distance. This dramatically simplifies the signal processing. Secondly, this method is less vulnerable to small errors in channel estimation. Since it is important only to get the direction generally correct, and you are not trying to correctly position a spot of energy as you are when you are using the focusing method. Okay, now some results. The results are shown as path gain, that is reciprocal path loss relative to that of the equal length free space channel. So zero dB, this line right here, means path loss equal to that of the equal length free space channel. Or alternatively, you might interpret the zero dB line as a surface which is preserving wavefront curvature. In each case, I will be showing results as a function of aperture size, shown here along the horizontal axis. So the curves, which are expressed in path gain, will generally trend upward. Separate curves are shown for the far case approximation, for focusing exactly, and for beamforming. 
In each case, there are separate curves for a variety of instant and scattering directions. In all cases, the distances to the transmitter and receiver are equal. We'll start at 10,000 wavelengths distance. Since the maximum surface size considered is 100 wavelengths across, this very obviously falls into the far case regime. So you can see very little difference between focusing, beam forming, and the prediction using the far case approximation. Nevertheless, you do see that focusing always performs better than beam forming, although marginally here. And this is, of course, expected. Now, if we reduce the distance to 1,000 wavelengths, you start to see the penalty you pay for beam forming. In this result, here is the 0 dB line. You see that beam forming runs out of gas right about at 0 dB for aperture side lengths greater than about 20 wavelengths or so. So, if you're going to be doing beam forming and you're not fully in the far domain, then there's an upper limit to how big a surface you could effectively use. And further increases in RIS size are not going to improve performance. One way to understand why this happens is to realize that when you are beam forming, the portion of the surface that contributes most effectively depends most directly on the effective focal length and not on the number of elements that you are using to form the beam, as long as the aperture is sufficiently large, larger than some minimum threshold. This is in contrast to focusing, where no matter what, more elements will always improve performance. Finally, we'll reduce distances to a scant 10 wavelengths. So now the far case approximation is certainly invalid. However, the general case expressions are expected to hold at least approximately as long as we are willing to neglect polarization. And we keep in mind our assumptions about the patterns of the transmit and receive antennas, which here would be assumed to be either very broad or very narrow. Either would work here. So here's the result. Here is the zero dB line. Up here is the now invalid far case approximation. Here is focusing, which of course is doing crazy good relative to simple reflection. And then down here is beam forming, which in this case is stuck within six dB of simple reflection and much worse than focusing, regardless of the size of the RIS. The jittering in the beamforming result is simply due to the fact that each additional edge element that we need to add in order to make the aperture larger is making a contribution with a phase which is essentially random with respect to what is needed for focusing. Finally, concluding remarks. Here I've shown you a simple physical model for received power in an RIS-enabled channel as a function of RIS size, link geometry, and element state. And then I've manipulated that to obtain a expression for the path loss. I proposed a benchmark in element pattern that is consistent with electromagnetic scattering theory and practical reflector ray design, and which can also be tailored to application. I've investigated the RIS size required to achieve path loss comparable to that for a free space path of equal length. Again, this is of primary interest in this blockage avoidance application that I addressed at the beginning of the presentation. Along the way, this concept of effective focal length has come up, and I've pointed out how this gives you some additional insight into these problems. And then finally, I've addressed the behaviors of focusing, that is the optimal selection of element states, versus beam forming, which is a suboptimal way to select element states, but which is of practical interest. In a nutshell, near case beam forming, equivalently emulating reflection, wastes RIS elements. So when the near case applies, focusing is the way to go. That concludes my talk. Thanks for listening.